Welcome to Rock Docs. I'm David Lizabram. I'm Andy Keats. And today we're going to talk about Woodstock 99, the concert, the documentary, the whole experience. <laughs> yes. Uh, so get ready for all of our corn takes, which I've <laughs> yes. been saving up for 20 long years. Yes. Limp yeah. Biscuit takes, yeah. you name it, they're coming at you. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get into that, however... Usually we do kind of a question. Today I'm going off format, and I want to uh, give a shout out to our cover art designer, NC Winters. Um, NC is a fine artist, painter. He designs uh, posters for bands you may have heard of, like Metallica, Nine Inch Nails, Primus, uh, among many others. Um, Those played at Woodstock 99. Exactly, yes. It ties in. Uh, He uh, is... Very good at it and very successful. I mean, when his like special editions drop, they go out, they disappear in seconds. Uh, but nonetheless, I strongly recommend you check out his art and support him, support artists uh, at NC Winters Art on Instagram. You can join the hundreds of thousands of people who follow him because he's really good and uh, support him. Anyway, he was he's also a extraordinarily nice guy and was nice enough to do our cover art. So if you enjoy the picture that you look at while you stare at your phone the entire time you listen to the podcast. Or if you have been wondering, how did these two idiots with this show get such great <laughs> art? <laughs> why this is the how? We why is do it? Why is the packaging <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> promise something the show does not deliver? Yeah, right. Well, there you go. Thank you, NC, and uh, thank you for listening to uh, Rock Docs. We can, of course, be found on Twitter and Instagram at Rock Docs Pod. And uh, with that exciting intro. We're going to talk about Woodstock 99, a documentary. I'm sorry. It's actually called Woodstock 99, Peace, Love, and Rage. It also, actually, I think it's called Music Box. It's Woodstock called Woodstock 99, <laughs> Music Peace, Box. Love, and Rage. <laughs> HBO Original <laughs> presents Music Box, Woodstock 99, Peace, Love, and Rage, directed by Garrett Price, 2021. Uh, so it's Sort of a, an, an event documentary yeah a lot of people were talking about this when it came out there was some buzz press yeah um it has the distinction of being uh, of occurring in a formative moment for all the people who are in mid-level media positions right now Mm. which is a a real a real sweet spot for content if you if you want if if you want your your documentary to be discussed right because there's a lot of 30 three to 40 year olds working in media right now right if you grew up watching michael jordan and uh maybe oj simpson (laughs) and his trial and then uh enjoyed the woodstock 99 pay-per-view there is a lot of documentary content for you right now yeah um what is this movie and why is this movie so i think this movie is a couple things one is it's a pretty straightforward self-contained story about this event right and takes a step back and puts it in the broader context of the culture at the time that's it's that's its idea that's the idea of this movie i would say is that woodstock 99 was a a tragedy a horror a disaster but one that was predictable based on the the nature of of popular culture in 1999 that's kind of the theory that the uh movie posits and all i knew about woodstock 99 all i really remembered was that uh it was a big disaster. Yeah. It was not remembered fondly. No. And there was fire. Yeah. All those things were true. Yeah. Based on this movie. Yeah. The director, sh- the be- it's kind of interesting. The very beginning of the movie is the director kind of showing up on screen, which is the only time he appears on screen to say, you know, you think this would kind of be a comedy, but really it turns into a horror movie. And it, in fact, kind of plays out like a found footage horror movie in a way. Yeah, and, and and I that's I guess kind of his idea too. And I, and I listened to an uh, interview with him with the the Ringer, who um, is the the media arm, uh, the media company started by Bill Simmons, who also has is a producer on this film, right? Um, who has a, a development deal with HBO, um, and I, my understanding is that this director. Uh, his pitch was, I'm going to do, I want to do Woodstock 99 as a horror movie. And I guess it is that, I guess it is that, um, it's certainly horrifying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the thing about the music in this movie is, you know, I was in ninth grade when Woodstock 99 happened. Mm-hmm. It's like sweet spot of my youth. And I did not like any of these bands that are featured in this film. Really? Right. No one I knew did. 
Yeah. None of the older people I knew did. Yeah. It was, they were certainly the bands that were on MTV. Yeah. And this movie talks a lot about when, how, how central MTV was to the culture at that time and the right. stranglehold they had on youth. And that is true, but it was like a specific type of youth. It was not at all like they were tastemakers. You know, it was not. Yeah. The, 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 it was not cool or hip to like Kid Rock. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? So just in terms of, like, what happens in this movie. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> just breaking it down. I mean, first of all, they very quickly dispense with Woodstock 69, the original Woodstock. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of that. Then there's a very brief mention, basically, of Woodstock 94, the 25th anniversary festival, which, uh, to all accounts, at least according to the movie, went off without a hitch. Everybody loved it, and it was great. So then five years later, they're like, let's keep the money printer rolling yep. and uh, do Woodstock 99. Um, the lineup for Woodstock 99, okay, first of all, it takes place <clears throat> on this abandoned Air Force base mm-hmm. um, in upstate New York. Uh, it was approximately 750 degrees that weekend. Uh, there was inadequate water, the, like, you know, sewage facilities broke down nearly immediately. Uh, the bands that were playing, primarily, at least the ones featured in the film, and the big ones on the big stage, were like Limp Biscuit, Corn. There was no real pop acts. This wasn't like Coachella now, where you have like Beyonce or Lady Gaga or yeah. Dua Lipa or whoever. It was all like, you know, in terms of the main focus, aggro rock, pretty much. Yeah. And then, um, as the movie progresses, there is uh, a lot of... Uh, Sexual violence. Yeah. Uh, there is um, uh, uh, like uh, people like living and rolling around in uh, feces. They get it's, real into the like logistical missteps of yeah. the organizers. Yeah, that not enough. <clears throat> uh, it, that they 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 went real cheap on security. Yeah, the uh, security problems. There is. Uh, I mean, a person dies. Yeah. Uh, the uh, and there's a lot of heartfelt interviews with his close friend who was there. Yeah. Um, there, I, I mean, it's a, it's a that's a nice little um, a nice little stroke they have with following that ki- the guy who died. Um, yeah, and they have his his journal that he kept over the course of the podcast. And it's, right, it's sort of like a Ken Burns yeah 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 thing where you like you have yeah. The, the civil letters, war, the yeah. Civil war letters home. Yeah, um, that's a good find. It, it's a good find in terms of in terms of documentary content. Yeah, that's a hit, yeah. and it's very effective. The the guy who speaks about his friend is extremely effective and a great you know uh, communicator. And anyway, by the end of the festival, like the it is like at least according to the video, uh, descended into complete chaos, lawlessness. Uh, again, you know. A lot of sexual violence, things just being torn down, the place being set on fire, and just a- an utter catastrophe. MTV, like, fleeing the scene. Yeah, MTV basically. left, <laughs> MTV uh, like, like it's not the safe day here. before the end, yeah. apparently, and, it, you know, it just was, uh, it was not, there was not a Woodstock 2004. <laughs> We've not seen too many Woodstocks since then because yeah. of the tarnishing of the reputation. Second Kurt Loder appearance on Rock Docs. Yeah. Kurt, Kurt Loder dispenses some harsh truths on air <laughs> yeah, to the to the lasting dismay of of john share yeah who joins ike turner in a, a real pantheon villain of of the rock doc <laughs> yeah. cinematic universe so he was like the main it seems like the main organizer there was this other guy mike who was the organizer and an organizer of the original woodstock but he seems mike seems more like the seems good time like party like a, guy? Yeah, he seems like he's a figurehead at this point. Yeah, he's the face of it. He's like an aging hippie. Yeah. This guy, John Scher, seems like the guy who's counting every dollar. Yes. And uh, who defends to this day that this was a fine festival where a few small, yeah. I guess, rapes and deaths happened. This but man, beyond this, that, it was a good time had by all. And Limp, Biscuit, <laughs> Limp Biscuit is just a fine band or something. This movie was made quite recently. Yeah. And John Scher sits in front of a camera in the year 2000, I understand. Well, 2020. Yeah, or the, excuse me, the year 2020. He sits in front of a camera and says with a straight face that one of his biggest regrets is that so many young women walked around showing their breasts. Okay, yes. Now it let's is, get... <laughs> like, I couldn't believe my ears. I could, I could not believe my ears. He's, 
He's had 20 years to think about this. Yeah. And that's his reaction now. Yeah. Not, it's not like it even would be okay then. Right. But at least you're defensive. Your career's on the line. Right. Your reputation's on the line. You're yeah. Looking, you're, we're left In to- retirement, he looks back and says, these women were asking for it because they took their tops off. <laughs> Truly unbelievable. Now, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that introduces Sorry. perhaps the main theme of this movie, mm-hmm. which is topless women. Yes. Um, so... The whole thing is about talking about the uh, toxic masculinity, sexually charged atmosphere that was happening r- around the music, around the whole circumstances. Yeah. That is like, if there's a main theme of this movie, that's it. Yep. And there is endless footage yeah. of women at this festival, you know, like you know, documented at the time, taking their tops off. Right. And it goes on through the entire movie. Yes. Is that a good choice? Like, maybe you need I to show some of that? I don't know that it's necessary. I mean, it's certainly, like... They certainly are beating you over the head with naked girls. I th- yeah. I, now, I think it, it does... I mean, it's... I, if I had to put a number to the number... The shots of of shirtless women in this film, I would say... 200 easily to 250 easily yeah it's so much <clears throat> now my guess is that the artistic decision there is that like it would be impossible to understand the vibe of this festival without understanding it was truly ubiquitous no this is not something that every woman encountered one time right it was all around you relentlessly morning to night for four days now, I'm not coming at this from the position of a prude. What yeah. I'm saying is... Oh, I know. I get it. Yeah, whatever. I'm just saying, like, if the theory of this movie is that, that these women exploded. were victims, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're certainly uh, not shying away right. from right. Uh, showing these now, presumably, most of them, uh, you know, if they're around still, they're adult women uh, in their youthful indiscretions. Uh, and there's nobody who's interviewed on camera who was one of those women. There are women who were at the show who were inter- interviewed on camera, mm-hmm. but none of them are the women, at least as far as we can tell, who were whipping their bikini tops off. Right. Like they're shown through the movie over and over and over and over and over again, even after that point has long since been made. But we don't, he- and, and they're positioned as the victims of this culture or whatever, but they're, they couldn't find one woman to cut, to look back and say, I don't know. I regret that. Or I had a good time or I was like anything like the, yeah. it's, it seemed like a weird omission yes. to not actually like to, to show so much of it and not have any of those people represented in contemporary interview. Yeah, that's true. They, what they do is they put it all in the context of how much time on TV after 10 o'clock at night, was filled with Girls Gone Wild promos right at the time. How big Maxim and FHM magazines were at the time. Yeah, a lot of that. And Bill well, Clinton and, and Monica yeah, Lewinsky Clinton, keep showing up for some reason. Yeah. Uh, once, thanks to some really trenchant political views from uh, Kid Rock, I believe. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it's Woodstock. It's a political festival by right. its nature. And Kid Rock got in on it by saying that Monica Lewinsky's a hoe. And Bill Clinton's and, pimp. And Bill Clinton's a pimp, right. That was the extent of his political commentary, uh, and he really should have stopped there. Yeah. And so they <laughs> – yeah, th- that was not a high point. And amazingly, <laughs> it's only gotten worse since yeah, then. Yeah, exactly. Rock's political views. <laughs> kept on doubling down on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. The, the, what they do is that there are, a lot, there are plenty of female voices in this movie. Um, well, maybe not plenty, but there are some. Yeah, sure. And what they talk about is – what it was like to be a woman in 1999. Right. Maybe not. You d- we don't have firsthand uh, perspective of like what it was like or why you succumbed to exhibitionism at Woodstock 99. Right. But you do have discussion from the female perspective about how, how okay it was to just exploit and, and objectify women in 1999, which is true. I was a, in high school at the time. It is shocking to think that look back on and the, sure. the movie does a good job of chronicling how permissive the culture was to that back then yeah i mean the the 
the movie does a good job of chronicling that. I'll agree with that. But I'm not sure that this point is like really I mean, the villain the villain of this movie is not really John Cher, although he doesn't come off as a hero. Okay, you know, whatever. Like you try planning a festival with three hundred thousand people, like things aren't gonna go always right. The villain of this movie is the the culture, the mainstream youth culture of nineteen ninety nine. Right. And that is embodied in everything from the uh Topless women to the girls gone wild to the Monica Lewinsky Bill Clinton thing to the to the, um, these bands to these bands Corn yeah. Limp Biscuit uh, even the Offspring yeah. you know kind of get in on it you know just Kid Rock Kid Rock um, to an extent Red Hot Chili Peppers you know yeah. sort of and well, I want to I'm gonna come to the defense of Offspring sure what he actually says is that he's seeing a lot of women who are crowd surfing getting groped. Right. And he tells him to knock it off. Yes. Now. He then follows that up. Goes, follow, what does he, yeah, he does what his follow, what is it? Yeah, he says, and if you're, oh, if, if you you're see a, girl, a guy crowd surfing, grab his balls. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Which is just, mm, at it's best like, we'll say it's an off-color joke in the moment. Yeah. It didn't really land. It didn't really land. Uh, I sort do, of undercut your point of being respectful being of other people's bodies. It, it's like, now now the whole thing has kind of devolved into a joke. Right. Um, I did write down uh, my notes that that guy's voice is is actually the voice of 1999 dexter holland yeah dexter holland's the 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 sound of that guy singing like hey man why don't you get a job right that is 1999 (laughs) sure that is what it sounded like (laughs) uh yeah exactly he is he's a very 90s kind of character yeah and and like a smart very smart person i mean he has a phd in like biology or chemistry or something like that so it's called biochemistry Sure. It's called biochemistry. Okay, thanks. Um, I, 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 I said let's call it. Yeah. Okay. Let's call it biochemistry. Um, yeah. On some level, he is in fact a smart guy. He yeah. doesn't come off necessarily at his finest, but yeah. I mean, it's the whole culture. They're talking about how on MTV, basically, what happens. The narrative about MTV, which is totally tied into this festival. This is like effectively an MTV festival. Yes. You know. Yeah. Is that MTV in the eighties was this countercultural? Uh, kind of force and phenomenon and even in the early 90s when you had you know there are breaking bands like Pearl Jam and Nirvana there's a lot about Pearl Jam and Nirvana and these grunge bands and how they were really progressive and um, breaking free of societal norms in terms of gender roles and all these other things and then uh, you know something turns and all of a sudden MTV is for younger people like that generation ages out which was really my generation like I you know Nirvana, all that stuff came out when I was in high school, and we were watching MTV, and then it kind of became like, here's this Total Request Live MTV. It was your, it was your little brothers. Yeah, it was like a, yeah, you know. it became like for younger people, and so the music that was popular at the time was a a really odd mix of the, er, like, kind of pop stars of the day were Britney Spears, the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Christina Aguilera, they were huge kind of coming along at this moment like maybe not fully all there but the backstreet boys certainly were mm-hmm. and then mixed with these super aggro new metal bands corn and limp biscuit you know being like really the standard bearers to an extent rage against the machine yeah. you know etc and they just were always together uh even though they seemed to have nothing to do with each other and it was like you know i don't know like it was, the, it was like a pro wrestling fight on trl every right day. it was just would, it was the good guys and the bad guys, yeah right? exactly and, and mtv was feeding team. yeah they were feeding off of this and the festival went all the way in the direction of the aggro bands yeah. because the in those days the idea of having a pop act like a britney spears type at a big rock festival would not they would never have considered that no. like you had you know jewel and cheryl crow maybe like you know pop pop type artists but still artists that were coded as rock they played instruments yeah. you know what i mean like they sang recognizable you know pop song you know rock type songs like in the kind of folky rock tradition mm-hmm. but still you know file under rock not under like cheesy dance pop yes. right yeah. nowadays again those distinctions do not matter uh but 20 years ago it may it was a big deal and yeah. I think, I I guess maybe the organizers kind of feel like, well, we just got stuck with the bands that were popular at the time and they happen to be these super aggro kid rock type bands. Well, and, but Jules says at one point that they didn't, that they decided that what Woodstock is, is every, however many years it's held, you choose the popular bands at that time. 
but a, you could also choose. I mean, this was only the third instance. Right. The, the, the trend is not so established that you're like, our hands are tied here. What do you want us to do? There's, there's been 17 Woodstocks. Right. We can't break the mold on, on, on number 18. It was the third one. They could have just as easily said, uh, Woodstock is an idea. Woodstock is associated with counterculture. Woodstock is, is associated with tie-dye and peace and love writers and peace and love and find those bands right and book them which they in fact did which they in fact did and you, you would not n- know from watching this documentary nary a mention of them so all right get into the side stage andy you all are right. like bursting out of your seat to talk about this <laughs> so i have all to- this week all i've been hearing about is all the other <laughs> bands that were woodstock 99 that were not on this documentary well so i was been si- i was sitting there watching this and i was just like well you know i've been to a festival there's more than just the main stage closer Right. You know, and which is really, it, uh, let me stipulate, the, the decision by the director to focus on what happened at the main stage when Limp Bizkit and Corn and Rod, Red Hot Chili Peppers were playing. And the place was like tearing and, apart. And they're setting it on fire and right. someone's dying and a lot of people are getting That's ready. what you want to make a documentary That's about. That's the right decision. Yes. He made the right documentary. Yes. Right? What I'm about to talk about is would not be an interesting documentary. However... It's interesting for podcast fodder. Sure. It's, it's so content. Here, here are some of the bands that were at Woodstock 99. Uh, Wyckoff Sean does make an appearance. Sure. Rage Against the Machine does make an appearance. Sure. Okay. Uh, Mo. <laughs> okay. String Cheese Incident. Mm-hmm. Bernie Worrell and the Woo Warriors. Mm-hmm. Love Bernie Worrell. Sure. Yeah. Uh, George Clinton and P-Funk. Uh-huh. The Roots. Mm-hmm. James Brown. Yep. G-Love. Yep. Bruce Hornsby. At, with G-Love and Special and Sauce? Special, of course. Wait, 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 he's going to leave him at home? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bruce Hornsby. Uh, Bruce Hornsby, Los Lobos. Mickey Hart. Sure. Okay. Grateful Dead member, Mickey Hart, yeah. representing. Uh, Tragically Hip. Sure. I okay. Guess they're near Canada. They're just like, well, yeah. let's, okay. let's do some Canada stuff. Sure. Uh, DMB. Guster. Strange Folk. Rusted Root. Willie Nelson. Elvis Costello. Okay. So you're telling me that during the Rusted Root concert, <laughs> yeah. the place did not degenerate into complete yeah. mayhem <laughs> with no respect no respect for people's personal boundaries. Yeah. Now, like, that lineup is basically Bonnaroo minus the headliners. Like, yeah. Like, three years later. Right. It's a know? pretty chill. It's. I, I mean, you got the it roots. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be the Dave best. Dave Matthews Band is a headliner. Yeah, sure. Right. And Dave Matthews, Matthews Band makes makes an appearance. A very brief appearance in the movie. Not especially flattering, talking no. about, about breasts as well. Sure. So like everyone um, who makes an appearance on this movie is talking about breasts. Right. If you didn't make an appearance in this movie, but you were there, you're stoked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because nobody like, comes off looking good. <laughs> no one comes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Moby hated this festival and amazingly comes out looking like as bad as corn. Or actually, look, corn... You know, the, the guys from Corn seem a little bit thoughtful about things. In I would say nobody, yeah. none of the artists who are interviewed yeah. come off worse than Moby. Yeah, <laughs> that, is, that is right. <laughs> We're not here to... It's like, how did you turn yourself into a villain here? You agree with the premise that this festival was yes. trash. <laughs> he is there to agree with the premise... <laughs> And somehow, somehow you come he is and you're like, so do I, sanctimonious. Do I like Limp Bizkit? <laughs> what is it yeah. Like, you know? uh, yeah. He, he uh, I mean, I, 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 the guy d- buries himself <laughs> and he is not aware that it's happening. Yeah. He is true. so self-righteous, <laughs> so, so convinced that he is the, uh, uh, that, that like they should have just had him book the festival right. because he is in tune with the youth and the positive vibes and like I don't even know man he just comes off so lame yeah. that like every time he's on screen I'm like give me more of that kid rock yeah <laughs> political commentary the the thing though that maybe is revealed by the undercard is that based on all the cultural discussion in the movie which is very real. I don't, I don't disagree with any of it, right? But based on it, they sort of treat this outcome as like an inevitability. Yes. And, you know, contrary to what you might gather from watching this movie, other festivals were happening at this time. Yes. And they, by and large, did not devolve into this. Coachella was like three months later, the first Coachella. And they like throw away the comparison and suggest that like maybe Coachella learned from Woodstock 99. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. 
Well, you know, like Bonnaroo starts happening three years later. Uh, the the my memory of festivals at this time was like so like Lollapalooza had winded down by this point, right? Van's Warp Tour was happening, sure. Um, but then Horde was, maybe Horde had stopped by this point. Okay, um, Fish was throwing gigantic festivals. Yes, right, like to a hundred thousand people right. in this same part of the country. Right, mostly. at which nobody died. At which nobody died, and. The, uh, and then there was like radio festivals, right? Right, that like every city would have whatever your alt rock station. Would. But that wasn't even really a festival. That's like a concert. Yeah, I mean, we, ours. We, yeah, you didn't camp out. So. It wasn't like a three days of peace, love, no. and whatever the name yeah. of your cheesy radio station is, right? But I went to those, and there were mosh pits, and there were you know, yeah, it was all, all right, the, you know. Well, here's you, you were th- out in the sun for twelve hours. <clears throat> here's the other thing about that. So I'm not like a hardcore metalhead or a punk rock guy. Yeah. Like I'm not trying to, you know, claim to be part of some community. Yeah. But I've been to my share of metal and punk and whatever type shows and concerts and whatever. And if you just showed up there from Mars, like and descended in a metal show, you would think this is like uncontrolled chaos. Yeah. But that's not really what's happening. No. There is a community. And there are norms and rules that are enforced. And certainly, like, nothing's perfect. There's no perfect community. But by and large, there are, like, elders in the community and people who are respected. And if you get out of line, somebody will correct you and show you the right way to behave and so forth. The problem with Woodstock 99 is not that there were metal bands or rap or whatever. The problem is that everybody there was a poser. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I think that's true. I think that's true. And I was I was thinking about this a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean just to to, just to kinda wrap up the point, like the people that were there it's not even necessarily a slam on corn or Limp Biscuit or whoever, right? Because I'm sure those bands to this day have played ton dozens of festivals yeah. and it's all been fine yeah. right yeah. and the dexter from the offspring and noodles from the offspring they talk about how like they play many times a festival in germany held in a like venue that was built by hitler yes. and it's fine yeah. right so like the same bands could play at a festival not that far apart in time yeah. and it would be fine the problem was like they I think what happened was these bands got so big Mm -hmm. in such a short amount of time that there was no opportunity for a culture to evolve around them and for those norms to be established. Like like Insane Clown Posse showed up and played. They're not really in the movie, but they are known for having very aggressive music and, you know, massages, whatever. But I'm not here to defend them. Just saying, like, they put on festivals all the time. And for what you hear about it, although it's not my type of music, like – there is a genuine feeling of love among the crowd. People are looking out for each other and respecting each other. I'm sure bad things happen because you get enough people together and bad things are going to happen. But by and large, it's not like an epic disaster that you're going to make a documentary about. Like Because there's a community. That, again, there are norms. You go and then you expect you're going to go again and see the same people. Yeah. So that conditions you to a certain type of behavior yeah. within a certain range here it was just people that showed up from they turned off mtv and hopped in their car and went to this festival they were not connected to any community the bands maybe they were trying to foster that maybe they weren't even thinking about it but they were you know it just all was happening too fast yeah. and i think that is really what happened i don't think it is the fault of you know any particular band no matter how stupid kid rock might be or how lame limp Bizkit might be yeah and i don't it's I don't know if it's because it happened if they they got too big too quick or whatever, but there definitely was no community. And I was thinking about it in the context of just like who was at this festival, because I, like the age I was, you you can't you couldn't really go to a three day festival. Right, you're, you're fifteen, you you can't do that. Right, right, sure. And my brother, who was seven years older than me, wouldn't have been caught dead at this festival. Right. So I and like they're talking about how it's like all these drunk, obnoxious white college kids wearing backwards hats there's video evidence i don't doubt that that's the case yeah that's de- it definitely appears to be the case but i it, their point about mtv being for younger people is true and so i don't know who was going to this concert see i know people you know? in college i was in college in los angeles so yeah. like nobody was flying across the country for this to go to woodstock 99 yeah but if it had you know if it had been in you know long beach or whatever like i know people that would have gone yeah. i might have gone just to I mean, go, but yeah, there were ba- good bands here. I mean, I think it's probably the case. But I know people who would have been. I, look, I'm not saying like would have committed a crime or something yeah, like yeah. that. But I know people who, you know, would have would have fit into that demo. Yeah. Like because, I mean, I remember in college, 
right around this time, I graduated in 99. So this was like a month after my college graduation. Yeah. And I remember like Rage Against the Machine was out and they were big at the time. Yeah. And I knew guys who would like turn on Rage Against the Machine on a Friday after classes were done and just like down a bottle of Jack Daniels between the two of them and then just run through the house just breaking things. Right. And I would be like, you know, Tom Morello went to Harvard, and he actually has a lot of interesting <laughs> things to say about Marxism. And that was not what they were hearing. Yeah, yeah. Like, Rage Against the Machine explicitly, to this day, talks about their political content, whatever, but there is a huge fan base, yeah. based on my personal experience, of people who hear that sound, yeah. and it doesn't matter that Zach LaRocha is talking about the Zapatistas or whatever. <laughs> That's not what they're hearing. Yeah, they're yeah. hearing curse words and screaming and loud guitars and drums and funky bass, and they just want to like party and tear stuff up. And that is like what these bands were were to a lot of people. Right. It was just a license to go crazy. Yeah. So I saw I you know maybe you well, were like no you have a better better perspective on it than as a college kid than I did as a right. It, but it, it was. There was nothing aspirational to going to Woodstock 99 from where I sat as a 15-year-old. Right. It was like, it didn't seem cool. It was on MTV. Yeah. Nothing cool about MTV. No, it was definitely not cool. Yeah, yeah, you know? Um, Yeah, so I don't know. That said, I I remember watching the fires and stuff on MTV. Uh, Boy, they're unduly harsh for Red Hot Chili Peppers playing fire by Jimi Hendrix when people are lighting things on fire. Yeah. They they really like that's a big thing. They like impute the, at the end like, of the the like closing night of the festival yeah. after all this stuff had gone down. Now, presumably Red Hot Chili Peppers didn't even know that all this like they were not in a position to know, I'm assuming, yeah. that like the toilets were overflowing and that people were getting lost and disconnected and there wasn't enough water and it cost yeah. $4 to get a water bottle and even you could even get one and blah blah blah. Yeah. Like they showed up to play a play. concert probably and on Sunday there's 300,000 people partying, yeah. and they see way off in the distance, from their perspective, some stuff on fire, and they don't know what it is even. Yeah. Like, maybe this is kind of part of the deal. Like, who knows? Whatever. It's cool. Yeah. And, like, then they play the Jimi Hendrix song, Fire. And, like, the people who were setting the fires, like, hundreds of yards behind them, like, you know, away from them, they probably couldn't even hear what song they were playing anyway. Yes. No, like there's no, cr- th- there's, there's no proximate cause there no. between them playing that song and the people that had already started these giant bonfires, not putting them out or like, what were they like? What was supposed to happen? There was like, it was du- like the fire was already raging. Yeah. I mean, boy, but flea does have some, w- some honed views on gun control that he decided to, to shout out to the crowd. Yes. If you have a gun, get rid of it throw it in the trash just throw it in the trash that seems like a safe move <laughs> it's just, you know it's like that they, they all had this compulsion to talk about yeah to talk about politics that they obviously were not political besides like rage and like maybe you know why yeah that went on to become a politician yeah they also it's like the these these like empty gestures to to woodstock 69 right that like a few have made like bush what i uh, did uh bush bush did like the country joe thing yeah or did, or, yeah bush did the country joe thing and um creed and creed yeah creed brought creed, out creed, Ro- robbie krieger the guitar robbie player krieger. from the doors so, who did not even play at woodsuck 69 no yeah and like I, I was i was just like what did robbie krieger do with creed like yeah what, exactly they, they, they don't play similar music at all <laughs> yeah and, i mean that i'll 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 give it up why clef Playing playing the Star Spangled Banner is kind of cool. That's okay. Sweet. I remember that okay at the time. That. Yeah. First of all, yeah. his guitar playing is atrocious. He shouldn't be playing the guitar. Okay. Second of all, I remember seeing that live. Yeah. Now he busts out a guitar that was a Fender Squire, like a two hundred dollar guitar, yeah. and it still had this sticker on it, <laughs> which you can see, like yeah. it is fresh from the store. Now, you don't, like, in a concert, play a guitar fresh from a store that's clearly a $200 guitar when you're playing unless. on the main stage at Woodstock 99, unless you're going to, like, destroy yeah. it and light it on fire, which he very clumsily does. Couldn't do, yeah. And he's... Turns out that's not that easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, 
it wasn't even at Woodstock where Jimmy let his guitar yeah, on fire. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of like mixed messaging happening yeah. there. It it doesn't come off well. No, it does not come off well. I mean, they're like he likes he's like getting people to help him start the fire. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. He. Everybody else is trying to put fires out. He's over here <laughs> unable to start a fire. Yeah. The only person at oh Woodstock '99 who could not light something on fire was Wyclef. Yeah, that's right. Um. <clears throat> all right. So kind of just detouring back into what we were talking about with Olympus getting the Moby. At one point, one of the people who was there, who's a journalist who speaks, Maureen Callahan, says... Um, she, she apparently wrote, I uh, did not read it, a uh, well-thought-of expose for Spin. Okay. Uh, at the time. So she says, like, there's no kid who's into Limp Bizkit who's also listening to Moby and Take Exity, Ecstasy and Bliss Out in the Rave Tent. Yeah. Again, I disagree with that. Yeah, I think that's probably un- untrue. I just think I know, and I knew in, 2000, in 1999, tons of kids who were into Limp Bizkit and also Moby because they were both on the radio. Yeah. And like might go and, you know, rage out to, you know, new metal and then also go dance in take ecstasy in the tent because like it's drugs. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> who doesn't like them, <laughs> you know, and they're partying yeah. and there's girls there and whatever. Like, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. the, 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 yeah, the, the, the like, she takes the stance of a music critic. Yeah. Yeah. Who's like, well, I, I like Moby because he reinterpolates classical, you know, what classic, uh, you know, blues music and other things into this, you know, electronic, which hasn't really caught on in America, but you know, people in Europe are really into it. One day it's going to be huge here. Like that, whole and meanwhile pose. and then limp biscuits trash yeah. yeah but like for a person who just like turns on the radio and there's some music there moby and limp biscuit existed very much in the same universe yes uh, much to moby's chagrin don't tell moby because he'll be sad about it <laughs> right yeah I, I i guess what's weird though is there was good music happening in 1999 if you wanted to put on a good a good festival in 1999 you could have should we just draft our fantasy Woodstock 99? Is that what you're trying to do? I've been thinking about okay, it. Okay, <laughs> please. I'm ready. No, we, we, we maybe we do that as, as bonus content or, yes. or, or a, a subsequent episode. <laughs> I, it's going to take more time than we have here. Right, exactly. But, but uh, it would be an interesting thought exercise. If you think about the, you know, the bands that you would want to get back together, the bands that are maybe a few years past their time prime, all the, all the classic festival sure. standbys of today yeah all the the big gets you know that that you that you bring back together for the festival show right plus the people who are newly breaking and the people who are, are big at the time you don't just have to go on the the 10 biggest trl uh you know artists at the time. well i think that lesson's been learned right <laughs> yeah. and yeah. now you get these big festivals where you'll get a paul mccartney or an elton john totally or you know bruce springsteen or whoever you'll get like one or, legacy classic stevie wonder type guy yeah, yeah. woman whatever then you get you know your contemporary pop like you get more of an interesting mix you're not just going to get one kind of flavor no yeah i mean you could go to at, at, at a festival like like bonnaroo you could go and listen to nothing but bluegrass for three days right and you could also go and listen to nothing but hip-hop for three days right you know so i think the whole thing is uh i mean you have to make decisions when you're making a movie but i think that what we're kind of dancing around is like they have clearly this thesis that the the society man is the villain yes um, which kind of gets the actual villain John off the hook. Yeah. Um, but okay. Yeah. Also, did we mention fuck that guy? Yeah. That guy seems like a dick. That guy sucks. Um, it's like fighting with, with journalists. Right. At the, during the, festival, at the time, at the time. And they're like, it seems like people can't go to the bathroom. Did you guys get enough bathrooms? And he's like, why don't you put your notebook down and go help? Like, <laughs> yeah, go procure. Don't criticize help. help. Yeah. It's like, like, what is this a war? Like, like you're getting paid presumably a fortune to put on this festival <laughs> and people do not have water or bathroom facilities <laughs> fuck you man <laughs> that guy that guy is a, a, we need to keep a tally of the villains of the of this of this show yeah ike turner sure ike turner <laughs> john right. share john share those to are be continued <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly uh yeah so um I, I well, again okay so it's not that they're wrong it's, it's not, not that, that the filmmakers wrong. are I wrong don't disagree it's I, not that they made a bad movie yeah no it's 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 there's stunning footage yeah it's well it's very well made yeah there's they they, the, they comb through 
endless hours of footage to the, put this together. And it's, yeah, it's gripping. The talking head segments they get are, are good. They're yeah. Good gets. The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. The artists that were actually there, the cultural critics that they have speaking on it are the right people. They're yeah. relevant. They have interesting things. Wesley Morris, super interesting things to say. Uh, yeah, some of the artists, like you said, like J- uh, Jonathan Davis from Corn. Uh, Scott Stapp from Creed, yeah. they come off pretty good. These yeah. are people who, in the time, I was like, these people are corny and lame. <laughs> and now I'm kind of like, mm, kind of had something to say. Like, all right, you're coming off better than Moby, at least. So <laughs> you got that going for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and he thinks this festival sucks. I'm adding Moby to the list of villains. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good point. I don't know how, sure. I, I don't know how the, he evaded the pantheon, my scrutiny so far. <laughs> the pantheon of Rock Dogs villains <laughs> yeah. are the, uh, the cops that pulled over Brian Jonestown Massacre in South Carolina. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. Anton's got to be on the list. <laughs> Anton is both the hero on the hero list and the villain he's, list. He's like Tony Soprano. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes, the vil- the the guy you love to hate. Yeah. Um, well, okay. all right. So your point about this uh, th- this brings me to something I want to say. The movies that I think this is most like, uh, and this will sound more like more of a criticism than I mean it. Are the Firefest doc movies? Uh, clearly, this is like if you liked Firefest, this is for you. Yeah, and it's it's, it's not the same thing. It's not no, but it's but it's the same thing in that it's like it's a think piece. Yes, about this event. Yes, this is a think piece. This is the good, mo- good call. Yeah, the movie's a think finally piece. Keats. <laughs> Your eyes lit up in a – it was a reaction that I've yet to get on any episode. You've agreed with something I've said. (laughs) Dear listener, you heard it. But it's not – the the movie has no um, intent to tell you something outside of the argument it's trying to make about what happened and why it happened and what it said about who we were at the time, which is fine. That's a fine thing to do do i i'm a journalist i i try to do that often yeah um but it's he says that he wanted to make a horror movie i i think he made wrote a, a vice article you know mm. and it's as a rock doc it's sort of an odd artifact because i think of like rock docs as something i'm a fan of yeah and it's a weird idea to be a fan of a vice article right you know but that's what this is it's a right it's an essay yeah 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 and if once you've got the argument, I don't see that much need to come back to it because I don't, I don't just don't want to. You want to hear your friends like drunken argument a third time, you know? Yeah, I mean, I hear you. I'm not gonna like be thrown on the Woodstock '99 documentary all the time just to yeah. like hang out. And I, Although, think, but that's not what it's trying to be. No, no. It, so you it, know, it's trying to be one specific thing, and it. And it does it very well. And I, and I think it's this trying is, to prosecute the '90s culture, and then be like, "Where are we now, yes. America, or whatever?" Right. And I think it's doing a, another thing at the same time, which is it's it is the first entry in Music Box. Okay, Music Box. Let's talk about Music yeah. Box. So and so, Bill Simmons, creator of The Ringer, which we should also say. Uh, is a podcast network and website, and they did a multi-part podcast series, narrative podcast, on Woodstock 99 right. uh, two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was created by Steve Hyden, right. who is a talking head in this picture. And a producer. And, a, and he has a producer credit. My understanding of the story behind his producer credit is that this director pitched this show to Bill Simmons right. through his HBO development deal and then they were like well yeah we already we did a documentary on it and he got in touch with steve hyden who had done a lot of the legwork already through the podcast and we should say we're both fans of steve hyden and his other work huge fan yeah right uh shout out to steve hyden yeah he's also i just found out he's writing a book about pearl jam right now okay cool published a book on the black crows radiohead he is podcast on a grateful dead guy grateful dead podcast big big grateful dead guy yeah which uh, 36 from the vault if you like this podcast and sure. you like the grateful dead you should probably be listening to 36 from the 36 vault. from the vault pretty good yeah pretty good uh so so steve hyden is, is brought into it that way um bill simmons prior to this part of his life had launched the 30 for 30 series at espn right where he used to work and famous series of sports documentaries that are like wildly successful wildly successful and 
they have devolved at this point into a type. Right. They are formulaic to the point that they're parodied often. Right. They're, it's it, it's it says something about their sense of style and their ability to present an idea that they're this easily parodyable. Yeah, but, it's like there's there's the Ken Burns style and there's the thirty for thirty style yes. of documentary. It's a, it's a thing. Yes, uh, and so they they've executed it very well. Uh, I love many of those movies, but it is a style at this point. Yeah, and this feels very much in the thirty for thirty style to me. So the premise here is that it seems as though they're launching a brand of rock docs, rock for docs. lack of a better term, yeah. under this brand Music Box, which right. will be on HBO through Bill Simmons' Ringer film production thing. Yeah. And this is the first one. Yeah. And it certainly got a lot of buzz. It certainly got a lot of buzz. And I think it set a very specific standard of being a think piece. Right. I, you know, that's my expectation of what Music Box is going to do. I'm curious to see what their ex- next topic is going to be. Yeah, I don't. I I'll be surprised. I'll be pleasantly surprised if the next one is some like, you know, they pick some obscure artist who you should know about. Hey, here's Jeff Buckley's life. Yeah, or something. And and, and they, you know, hey, here's this artist you should know about. We're going to look at a particular four years section of his career where he was really influential and 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 created a lot of other people who you love. Yeah, they're not going to do a documentary about, like, the Duke Ellington band <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that's not their thing. It's not Bill Simmons' thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And that's fine. And that's fine. It, it, yeah, I don't, I don't mean any, but... But the next one is going to be, like, the East Coast versus West Coast rap war yeah. of the early 90s. Yes. Like, that would fit right into their, you know... Actually, r- right? Bill, you want a free idea? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Adapt, meet me in the bathroom. Okay, meet me in the bathroom. Adapt that as a documentary. Yeah. Multi-part if you want. Sure. Classic. It's screaming to become a a documentary. Classic rock book about the uh, New York bands of the early 2000s. You got your Strokes. You got your Interpol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, of course. Uh, You know, so Mm -hmm. great book. Meet me in the bathroom. Highly recommended. Uh, Rock Docs Book Club coming soon. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah, so... So yeah, there's that that. So and, yeah, so they're trying to make a point. Yeah, is the bottom line, and I just don't know that they. I just don't know that I came away convinced that the this culture that I lived through, yeah, uh, and these bands and everything like, like necessarily causally lead to yeah I've, this I've, explosion of, of. I have some real questions about the causation here. Yeah. Now, if you want to ask me, was the late '90s, early 2000s a horrible time in in the objectification and exploitation of young women yes absolutely i will no doubt i will sign your petition yes without question yeah and were the people who attended this festival assholes who behaved horribly yes a lot of them yes (laughs) sure yeah yeah yeah, a a lot of them yeah the the ones depicted in this movie no doubt they're posers (laughs) yeah they're posers fuck those guys but do i think that those two things are as closely tied or they, they're certainly closely tied. Do I think there's a causal relationship between those two things as posited by this film? I'm a little bit hairy on that. Yeah. Um, I also have one note. Sure. Napster has no business in this movie. They talk about the – a couple of things come <laughs> up in this movie that have nothing to do with anything. One of which is like uh, Napster, uh, people stealing music, and the lawsuit by Metallica against Napster that All people were mad come- about – after this movie uh, after did that. not happen in <laughs> July of 1999 when people were at this concert and stoked to see Metallica yeah. who closed the concert yeah. uh, or at least Saturday night, whatever. Like yeah. they, uh, they, those people were not angry that Metallica in the future would sue <laughs> right. some kid that stole some songs off of Napster, which they were not, they did not feel an, an entitlement to free music. Which they had not yet received. <laughs> yeah, on account of that had couldn't nothing. do that on the internet yet. And they had a Talking head segment with Dave Mustaine of Megadeth, yeah. who I guess was the last band to play at Woodstock '99. Yeah. 
Uh, and he's, he's talking kind of about funny. It's, it's a, he's it's, cool. It's a funny little interview. He's an he's an interesting Maybe, dude. And I can imagine that they just like had that in the can, and they're like, "What are we going to do? Not use Dave Mustaine just dunking on Metallica?" Yeah, it's great. It's good uh, stuff. He was an original member of Metallica, yeah, right. uh, North County, San Diego resident. Okay, right. <laughs> Dave Mustaine. Uh, yeah, it's cool that he kind of goes off a little bit about why Lars wanted to sue Napster, but and he points it, out he, he points out like when they were first getting in band, they used to tape trade. Yeah, and they were really into it. And that's it, how they learned about music, and that's how they ex- spread their music. Right. Which, but, great, awesome. But what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> it has nothing to do with Woodstock 1999. Um. Anyway, this movie has a lot of good stuff, though. The security guard is great. The security. There's guard interviews awesome. with this guy who was a security guard who just yeah. dunks on the prep and training, yeah. and um, and, and, and talks about how he has he like was at you know, he was doing work after Hurricane Katrina and other like disasters and that this was way worse (laughs) and just way like not worse in terms of like as many people died, but worse in terms of the way that humanity behaves. Yeah. Like after these, you know, natural disasters, people come together, they're like supporting each other, they're trying to help each other out. And this was the opposite of that. It was just like violence and mayhem with, you know, no parents around. Yeah. And he's good. I mean, really, pretty much all the like interviews with people who were there yeah. are really compelling. Really compelling. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the the guy whose friend died is heartbreaking. Oh my god! Of course. Yeah, and they, it's 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 well executed and doesn't feel pressed. Steve Hyden. I mean, sure. I'm, I'm we're in, on the I'm, record. I'm in the can for Steve Hyden. We're, like, we're on the record as yeah, being fans. But like that guy. Yeah, he's he, good. He was great. Everything he said is great. Wesley Morris, uh, com- cultural commentary for the New York Times great Mm -hmm. Uh, like i'm a fan of his whatever he has to say it comes off great um you know just in general he's just a really compelling guy i do think that the thing that he says though again they talk about dmx the rapper who appears at the festival they briefly this is a brief detour of the movie oh yeah that does not come back around but early in the festival dmx shows up and he was a popular rapper at the time extraordinarily popular extremely popular 15 you got in a car in high school that's what was on yeah late 90s dmx was huge yeah Uh, and he crossed over yeah like he was popular with white people black people like he was universally beloved not universally but like he was you know very popular yeah and his music was very aggressive but still like in a positive way in a weird way and yeah they they get into this whole detour where he shows up on the stage it's like during the day yeah and his the big thing that he does is like the song is my n word, yeah. and so it's a call and response thing yeah. where, like, you know, as Wesley Morris says, like in the black church, like the preacher says something, the audience knows what to respond. Here he goes, my, you know, and then he has the audience, which is 70,000 white dudes yeah. yelling it back to him. And they talk about, like, well, how would that have felt if you're one of the few people of color in the audience or, you know, women of color or, you know, whatever? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's interesting. And then they don't talk to anybody. They so don't. I'm, I'm kind of like, you couldn't attract anybody down to yeah. follow up on that? Yeah, and, you know, that could have been a hard uh, sure. a hard reporting. Uh, but he says something else that I disagree with. Okay. Now, uh, I think he's obviously completely right that that would have been a horrible thing to be there for. If sure. If were one of the only black people in the crowd. But what he also says is that all of these people or almost all of these people if you pulled them out of this crowded environment out of the the heat of the moment yeah and you were having lunch with them on a tuesday and asked them if that was okay they like, would all know that it is never okay to say that word they would know that the right thing to say yeah is no there's no place there's no circumstance in which you would say that word but i don't even think that's true i don't know i th- the, the attendees of this festival in 1999 Right. I think there would – I won't bother trying to guess to put a percentage on it because who who needs that? But I think there's a substantial portion of people who would do what the alt-right assholes are doing on the internet right now and saying like, well, if he can say it, why can I say it? Why can't I say it? It seems fine. It's just it's just a lyric. I Like I think he's being – he's giving the crowd way more credit than it deserves that they – are woke to the fact that they shouldn't have been saying that. Well, I agree. Or, or and I even think that they would know after the fact that they shouldn't have been saying, it. I don't, I, I think, I think you would, 
I think I think you ask Kid Rock, is that okay? He'd be like, yeah, that's fine. Well, also and, they're being directed to by a black man on stage, right? Who's telling them what to say, right? And that's the word they're supposed to say, yeah. And he keeps doing it over and over again, yeah. So, you know, here's an auth- <laughs> an authority figure, right. supposedly, yeah. Now, Kate, you've once again stumbled into a good point. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Much to my chagrin. Well, so I think there's there's like that that points to something else which is that there's a lot of like what where politics have realigned that you can squint and see in 1999 yes. in this movie when i see these guys and yeah. they're 20 yeah. and they're shirtless and they're sunburned and they're you know partying and just tearing the place apart and being general assholes yeah i look at these guys and i go yeah about 20 years from now, yeah. you're going to be invading the Capitol on January 6th, 2020, and 2021. There's, and there's like this. You're this, that Mac. You're a future MAGA anti-vaxxer QAnon idiot right and there. And there's this like mystery in the film about like, you know, how can these, this countercultural impulse not recognize the, the discrepancy in, in how they're behaving or what they're doing. And it's just a misunderstanding to think of these people as countercultural at all. They're right. not. They're anti-authoritarian. Right. They're anti-authoritarian and that's it. Yeah. And and, and that's reflected with the people on stage too. Yeah. Like Kid Rock, Limp Bizkit. That Yeah. The, the, it, right down to the the actual things they're saying. Yeah. There's nothing even approaching liberal about it, classically yeah. or otherwise. They're yeah. just the, the the thing that they're rebelling against is authority of any kind. Right. An authority that tells you that you as a white man yeah. can't do whatever the hell you want to whoever you want, no matter what color or gender or whatever they are. And that's as good a description of Trumpism as you'll ever find. Yeah. <laughs> I did kind of feel like that was a missed opportunity in yeah. the movie. Like instead of looking yeah. at the time and saying, well, you know, th- if they're going to look forward to Napster, <laughs> keep going forward, go yeah. to the tea party, go to Trump, go yeah. to like, you know, the whatever, like the, the QAnon you know, yeah. shaman guy like that would also have been an interesting point to tie through. If you're going right. to look into the future and say, not only does what this say about 1999, but what does it say about 2021? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's, uh, I'm certain that a lot of those assholes are QAnon Trumpist guys. Yeah. I'm sure and, they're probably, most and, of them are just regular. And Joes. I'm sure their friends aren't sitting there going, but it doesn't make sense. They went to Woodstock 99. No, 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 no. How do, how do, what happened? What happened yeah. between then and now? You know? Yeah. There were just, he was just enjoying himself <laughs> li- listening to corn. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I guess now we kind of come to the point of asking, uh, I mean, this is such a different movie than some of the other rock docs. It is. Like, I, I think partially but, because it's a think piece. Right. <laughs> But if somebody doesn't know anything about Woodstock '99 yeah. or any of the, or this era or whatever, do you recommend this to them? Yeah, I, I would, but I would recommend it to them not in the way that I would recommend the Last Waltz to them. Sure, as like this is this is a, a piece of culture that I revere. Right. That like pour yourself a glass of wine and enjoy it. Right. This is a beautiful experience. Yeah. That's going to take you back to a glorious moment. Yeah. No, I would recommend it the way I would recommend, like, reading an article. Right. Or, or you know, it's like, hey, it's good, you know, like, you know, that I, I could be at a party and do some version of the show that we just did with somebody. <laughs> sure. You know, and if somebody else says, well, should I watch it? Yeah, yeah, watch it. You know, it's like, it's like you watch it. It's to qualified. Be like, yeah. It's qualified recommendation. You watch it to be in on the dialogue. Right. You know, the the, the never-ending discourse. It's part of that now. Right. But, but I... And, and despite that, it's expertly made, and I, I don't mean this as like film criticism of the the makers of this movie who who deserve esteem for their technical prowess, but like I don't, I wouldn't, I don't want a DVD of this. No, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't see myself ever watching this again, having watched it a couple times before this episode. In twenty years, when my son gets into rock docs which is inevitably gonna happen <laughs> sure. i'm not gonna tell him to go back to this one no you know so but if know. he's interested in the culture of the late 90s or yeah. whatever like it just, yeah it's it's just like it's perfectly made to be discussed on podcasts not yes. just this one but all you know it's, it's perfectly made to be written about on slate when it came out it's it, it's it's part of the the content mill of of 
2021. Which we are all slaves to. Yeah. The Rock Docks Industrial <laughs> Complex. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Woodstock 99, a qualified recommendation. <laughs> uh, and uh, as always, uh, I guess, we do um, uh, playlists on Spotify uh, tied to each of our episodes. This is our toughest bet yet. This is a tough assignment. <laughs> yeah. So what we're doing is we're sparing you the corn and Limp Biscuit and Kid Rock, which you can certainly find on your streaming channel of choice. I'm going to throw one Limp Biscuit track on there. Okay, so Andy's going to make a, a playlist one. that is primarily going to be the uh, the the bands the 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 not the main stage bands. Yes, the yes. bands that uh, you know kind of were on a different trip, uh, but still associated with Woodstock '99. So if you're interested in the alternate history of Woodstock '99. Yeah, which check out the playlist. Yeah, speaking of which, uh, the, I have a, a friend who I, I sent that list to, and he told me, yeah, there's a, a hot discussion on Reddit that's been going for months now of people who said that they attended Woodstock 99, didn't see any of this stuff, and had just had a great time. Just had a very normal concert experience. If you are one of those people, yeah, uh, at Rock Docs Pod <laughs> yes. on Twitter. Yeah, we want to hear <laughs> your content, your firsthand knowledge about Woodstock '99. Tell us what we're wrong about, right? And uh, if you are not at that festival, you can also reach us there as well. And uh, with that, thank you for listening to Rock Docs. <laughs>
um, along with Alanis Morissette and Jewel. You know, this was this was music that uh, that was very part of my life, and it was very formative, I guess, of the time for me. So, uh, and, and for the festival itself, I was not there, but I did order the pay per view. I was in college. I was living in my first apartment with a roommate. I ordered the pay per view. I spent the whole weekend. Uh, with friends over watching uh, this this event unfold. And at the time, you know, it felt crazy, but not as crazy as it does looking back on it now. I just felt like it was more like FOMO, I guess. Like, I wish I was there, craziness, um, watching this. And it, it wasn't until, I guess, uh, five or six years ago, I started going down a YouTube rabbit hole on Woodstock 99 and really kind of got a sense of what happened. I started reading all the exposés and think pieces that come out over the years. And I could not believe a doc had never been made on this event. And it just felt ripe for a story. And I approached the ringer with this. I was like, this is kind of the perfect, the, the, the perfect story. I think in what you're looking for, you know, kind of these guidelines of these watershed moments in music culture and history. And they're like, hey, that's funny. We actually did a podcast on Woodstock 99 a couple of years ago with this journalist, Stephen Hyden. Um, but we never really thought about putting it in documentary form. And I was like, well, it's such a visual <laughs> experience. There's so much footage of this. Uh, and that was kind of my pitch. I, I made a little pitch tape and a, and, a, and a deck. And I got a phone call from HBO saying, we want to we wanna green, green like this and go forward with it. And I actually teamed up with Stephen Hyden who had done a lot of research on it and brought a lot to the table, specifically contacts and people to reach out to, which really helped out a lot. That he'd done a lot of the legwork for, because, you know, this got greenlit at the beginning of the pandemic. So making a documentary during COVID wasn't the easiest thing, especially one as big as this, where we had to go all over the country to shoot interviews with not only artists, but also attendees. Um, so having... You know, having him a part of this was a real you know, benefit. Um, and he's also makes it for a great talking head as a cultural analysis. Yeah, big, big uh, Steve Hyden fans over here. Oh, are you? Um, great. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious how how much in the um, in the production and creation elements was a discussion about what Music Box was going to be? Did you have any sort of discussions with them about any health style that they were trying to create? beyond you know what you already described about their sort of story selection or their topic yeah, selection not at all they did not want any of these to feel alike they wanted really singular visions from every filmmaker which was kind of a cool thing you know they they, they they really wanted every film to feel like its own film um and its own kind of you know voice i guess you could say so that i mean really the world was my oyster in telling the story which was really nice and a lot of respect, not only HBO, but also to the Ringer and Bill Simmons over there. They really are kind of filmmaker forward, I guess, in the way they think. So a lot of the movie is made up of, you know, the footage, you know, the, the footage you or I might have watched on a pay-per-view 20 whatever years ago. Um, who owned the rights to that? How did you guys get that? Was there, you know, was there any controversy or concern about that? Oh, I mean... We we YouTube stalked people, kids that had brought handy cams in at the festival, um, and then a lot of it was owned by John, Sharon, Michael Lang, the the promoters of Woodstock '99, and we licensed it directly from them. Um, you know, they, I want I want to say they're partners in this film, but they were a part of it, and they you know were willing to let us license their footage. Um, and but the so I would say probably fifty fifty was what they owned along with the pay-per-view they owned. Um, and then a lot were attendees and that it was almost like the attendees footage I was more interested in because that really gives you this kind of boots on the ground experience of what people were going through that weekend. Where, as you said, a lot of the footage is, you know, from the pay-per-view is stuff we had seen before that exists out there on YouTube. Um, and it's an easy find. On the licensing question, uh, just occurred to me. I, I recall a few weeks or maybe maybe a few months after the event at the um, MTV VMAs, Ad Rock from Beastie Boys um, did a sort of sober call to arms about what had happened to women at Woodstock 99. What was there? Um, did you look into that clip at all? And was there any issue with MTV licensing that for you? Well, that, that was in my epilogue to the movie. I couldn't get it. Oh, really? 
Oh, it's a, it was that was one of my big bummers not being able to get that. Um, the, you know, there's something in, called fair use where you know, depending on the context how you're using clips, sometimes you can use stuff without licensing. But because of the way I wanted to use it, it was post. I really wanted to stay in the film within the the festival itself. I didn't want to kind of go like down the road too much. Besides, we kind of step out a little bit with Coachella. Um, besides that, I, I really wanted to end when the festival ended and kind of have an epilogue and credits would kind of go beyond that. And I had that in the credits and because of the context, I wasn't able to fair use it and MTV wasn't going to play a game with giving me the shot. So it, it's a bummer because I think it's a really telling, you know, moment uh, that happened just a few months later. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting kind of him kind of pointing the finger at the music industry itself and putting blame on it. You know, I think it's a really powerful moment. It's a bummer. It's, it's one of my big bummers not having it in the film. Well, yeah, we definitely recommend, you know, people can, um, you know, look that up on YouTube because it's yeah. definitely worth uh, following up after the film. Um, in terms of, you mentioned John Cher, um, who was, you know, I guess, I don't know exactly what his title was, but he seems like he was kind of the head guy, the head promoter who put this thing together. Um, in the, in the film, he's, uh, I would describe him as being quite defensive, um, mm-hmm. still believes that um, things went, uh, you know, more or less reasonably well, or that, you know, most people had a good time or something like that. Um, was it tough to get him to talk? What was it? Was he like that in the room? Does he, you know, have you heard from him? I'm just really curious. Cause he seems like yeah. if anybody is the, um, you know, antagonist or villain of this film, um, he, he's kind of comes off that way. Right. And that, that was never the intention. I didn't want to like, you know, I didn't know that like this was, that was not my intention taking him in there. I'm putting, I, I, I didn't want to indict people in this movie. Honestly, it was more of a, you know, an oral history of the event from lots of different points of views. And I think what's so fascinating about this event to this day is the amount of finger pointing done <laughs> uh, of whose fault it is. And I think, you know, we can talk about this later, but you know, I think there's a lot of things that go into that about, about where, where blame is to be put on. But, um, but John, you know, he was willing to talk and he, you know, I have to respect his honesty, and, you know, and, and he's willing, he, he has these beliefs and he has stuck with them. Um, I was hoping that, you know, there's been reflection as 20 years have gone on. Um, and, you know, he, he interviewed in Steve's podcast also, and he had said some of the similar, this isn't new stuff. You know, he has kind of said the same things over the years about the festival. So I wasn't all that surprised what he said. I was hoping that, you know, by the time he's on camera for a documentary on HBO, he might have reflected a little bit more and chosen words wisely. But at the same time, this is what he believes. And I think, you know, if, you, if there's themes in my film, one that I really kind of honed in on was power dyna- dynamics of the late 90s, whether it was generational when you kind of talk about Michael and John and kind of pushing this festival on a younger generation or gender power dynamics of the time or class or, you know, even race. So it, it kind of fit in, you know, getting their point of view and what they thought was thought 69 meant and was thought 99 meant to this generation. And it kind of, like I said, kind of, kind of fit in one of these themes I was exploring as far as kind of generational power dynamics and, you know, you know, and, older generations pushing their ideals on younger generations and the dangers of nostalgia a little bit, um, which I find really interesting. Um, and I, I'm just as guilty of it also push on my own children. It's like, you know, they go, to, they go to a concert or a festival. They watch the whole thing through a phone. And I'm always like, why are you watching it? Why are you experiencing it? But like, who am I to say, you know, this is, this is how you're enjoying this moment, you know? So I think there's something really interesting that I explored there. So with the, the music um, that is present in this festival, yeah. we just did an episode on Buena Vista Social Club. Mm-hmm. And so that's a, you know, a documentary where a big part of the appeal is, is the music and the performances. And so you get these long, uninterrupted um, performances that you know, people enjoy the music, and that's why, a big part of why they watch the movie. I wonder... And I don't want to be too harsh on new metal. Uh, I'm sure it still has its fans, but it isn't music that people that really like a lot these days. There's not a, a lot of people still um, begging to listen to contemporary uh, concert performances from Corn and Limp Bizkit. 
And so I wonder how how you grappled with that when for a lot of music documentaries, the the reason people are watching is because they like the music and they want to hear more about it. This is sort of a, a disaster where people wanted to see how the disaster happened and the music um, is sort of used only insofar as it is part of that story. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it was one of the harder things in this film because I had to make it a film. <laughs> I didn't have the, the kind of the luxury of a series where I could really kind of live in some of these moments a lot longer, you know? And at the same time, I, did, I didn't want it to be somewhat of a concert film. You know, I, I had, again, the luxury, we were able to license some of these songs, you know, and I wanted to live, I wanted it to feel at like moments you're in the crowd watching these performances because they are really captivating to watch. You know, that corn performance, it's like, that audience is locked in. That DMX performance, that audience is locked in, along with like, you know, Limp Bizkit and Alanis. And it, it, it was really kind of wonderful to watch that and it's mesmerizing. But at the same time, I had to push the for story forward, you know, in, in a, you know, within under two hours. <laughs> so it, it, it was tricky on that level. Uh, also, it, it, these songs, everyone knows them, which I find yeah. kind of amazing too, right? Like, like you kind of can fill in the gaps yourself <laughs> as you watch yeah. it. And another thing I wanted, I was really conscious of is the songs chosen in the film had to not only work as a performance, but also had some subtext to them also. Whether it was so on the nose, like Atlanta's playing ironic, talking about, you know, the amount of female performers there, or, you know, as simple as Durst doing break stuff, you know? So, or, or the offspring, you know, doing their, doing their song. So it, they all kind of per served two purposes besides being a performance to show, but also was kind of saying something within the lyrics itself to what a, a point the film was trying to make if that makes sense as you're watching it. Yeah, it does. So did you, did you at all, um, and, and I certainly don't, as you mentioned, you barely had enough time to show long performances of the, the headliners who were, you know, part of the action here. Um, but I was personally fascinated and, and David and I did this on our, our episode. We looked at some of the other artists, like the, the side stage artists. And, um, just cause I was curious who, who all was at this festival. And, uh, Obviously, you didn't have time to to go into this in any in in any depth, and it would have made for a less interesting movie. But when you're you were doing your research and and kind of um, scrounging for footage, did you see like the other festival that was happening outside of the the riot, basically, where you awesome. know you've got you've Absolutely. got bands, yeah, you've got bands like the Roots and Mo, you know, I think, Mo, yeah, Mo and String Cheese Incident and these like late '90s jam bands, Guster. Um, what, you know, what, what can you tell us about the sort of alternative to the alternative Woodstock 99 festival? And it was there and, you know, there was what felt more like a Woodstock type festival happening simultaneously as, you know, as these kind of bigger mainstream acts. But we, we stuck with kind of the mainstream acts of the time, you know, and the main stage acts of the time. And that, that was a, again, besides like making it more interesting narrative, you know, it also, yeah. that, that is what the festival honed in on as who they wanted to play. And that was the audience they attracted as far as kind of the mainstream audience they attracted, you know, that those are the bands that have been playing on the main stage at Woodstock 69, you know, then that's what this was about is like, those are the biggest bands of the time. Um, and that's, you know, who these promoters booked at the time. Um, and it's, it's not just about them just booking the biggest bands at the time. It's also says about the culture itself. And I wanted to explore a little, why are these bands so popular at that time? You know, what was it? Because they they tapped into the zeitgeist of, of, the, of the culture of the time. And what was it? So, I, you know, we try to do some dives on that, too. You know, it's it's anytime you do any type of, type of cultural analysis and any type of you know, film, you're going to get blowback because everybody experiences culture differently, mm -hmm. uh, which it, it's, it's hard to do. But it, you try your best, you know to kind of, at least the way you experienced it as a, as a storyteller. And it felt like how a lot of people around you experienced it, um, especially kind of, you know, the population, the major population. Those were the bands that, you know, were, like I said, they were the, those were the MTV bands at the time. And this felt like an MTV festival. You know, this was 
And, and it, it, there was something so interesting also about why a lot of this music was kind of kind of making its way into the mainstream to me, you know, especially at the time, you know, Limp Bizkit was just on this meteoric rise at the time, you know, along with Kid Rock and Corn had came a little earlier, you know, but at the same time, they're massive, you know, and then that kind of so interesting that, you know, on MTV, you would have a Corn video followed by a Britney Spears video. It just felt so like kind of all over the place, you know, going back and looking at it in hindsight. And I thought that was really interesting too. Um, and something I remember fondly coming home from school every day, watching TRL, you know, and watching these videos and just sitting there, you know, and kind of like, you know, for me, I wasn't, you know, anti Backstreet Boys. I only listened to Corn. I kind of just went with it. But I know a lot of people that were like that. Um, which I found interesting too. Um, yeah. and I also found it interesting, like, you know, talking to Carson Daly and Dave Holmes, both of them, you know, MTV, you, in like the eighties, you could have Michael Jackson and Van Halen, you know, back to back and everyone was fine with it, but it started to change in the late nineties. And I was curious about why that was happening too. No, I mean, I think narratively, there's no question that what, <laughs> that what, that what you did is a more interesting movie. Uh, I just I, like as a music nerd, I was laughing at the idea of, you know, somebody al- almost like like you go into the woods to go camping and you come back and, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has happened in those five days before, when you were out of <laughs> cell phone service. Yeah, It's like I'm imagining somebody who just spent their whole time going to see Bernie Worrell and the Woo Warriors string cheese incident in Mo. And they're like, wait, what happened over at the main stage last night? <laughs> I mean, you had like G Love playing and then James Brown playing. I mean, there's something, there's actually some really, like, like James Brown and George Clinton played too. There's some actually really fascinating, you know, yeah. you know uh, artists that played at the festival. And there's actually, you know, the, listen, if I had the luxury of like a six part, you know, series to tell the story, I, it could easily be done. But at the same time, I don't know if I'd want to watch this story longer than a film version of it because it gets pretty grueling as it goes on um, and you get hit with some pretty hard stuff to watch. And, you know, and again, I think for a lot of us that kind of came of age, you, you kind of self-reflect a little bit and you feel yeah, making it, I started to feel a little guilty of how I grew up a little bit, you know, and I don't want to ruin people's childhoods with this stuff. That was never the intention, but I think it's important to go back and look on how uh, maybe I shouldn't have acted like this, or maybe I shouldn't have allowed my friends to act like this around me. I think, you know, I think a lot of this experience like this. Well, absolutely. And on that point, I mean, a lot of the film is about the treatment of women, both in the culture and at the festival, the exploitation of women, the expectations about um, behavior. Um, and the film, I mean, to be blunt, features a lot of female nudity, um, the footage at the time. How did you approach that in terms of thinking through how to, you know, make it clear what that experience was like without, you know, it, it feeling exploitative or that you were, you know, potentially traumatizing people or, you know, that were there. I mean, it seems like a really complex subject to touch on. Really hard. It, it was, it was, I said the Beastie Boys thing was one of the hardest things not to have in. The hardest actual part of this film was telling that side of the story, you know, especially as a male filmmaker through a male gaze, you know, but at the same time, as a documentary filmmaker, I wanted to tell a story of how it is, how it, how it happened, how it unfolded. Um, a lot of this footage has been out there in the world, blurred, covered up, and sanitized. And, you know, the, my first cut, I blurred everything in this film. And, in fact, I started, when I started showing it to kind of, you know, not only HBO execs, who are all females, a lot of a lot of women and those responses that why are you sanitizing it? It's like you're making this, you're doing the thing that this should not be doing, and really showing the horrors of this at the time. This how this is how it was for us going to festivals and the way we were treated, and it it, it was something that again, like it was we took we were very cautious about, and I think a lot of people are like, oh, it was nonstop nudity in the dock, and truthfully, and and I think it's just. The way we tell the story, the context, I think there's 15 shots of nude women. It just feels so abundant in the film in the end. Um, and every single one of those shots was so carefully chosen not to be exploitive, but to really feel like you're getting a sense of what it was like there. Um, and, it, and also, like, it was, we were careful to say, hey, it's wrong for women to be taking their clothes off or men to be, and the men were naked also, men to take their clothes off. But kind of the point was, 
you know, this festival was marketed towards kind of the ethos of 69, this free love, you know, you know, experience that, you know, we experienced in the late sixties and you, you marketed it as that with the name Woodstock and kind of this somewhat toxic culture of the late nineties. And you create this kind of this very dangerous place for women. And I think the culture of the time with things like girls gone wild and the lad mags of the time, like FHM and Maxim, I think it, made a lot of men emboldened that they could treat women a certain way at the time. And that mixed with, you know, again, the marketing of 69 and this kind of free love experience uh, and the countercultural ideals, it, it just, it, it just did not work. And, and I, I, I really wanted to show what happened and the danger of it all. And as hard as it is to watch, um, I did not want to sugarcoat any of it. Again, I feel like as a documentarian, it's my job to show the way it happened. And that, and I think it, it and honestly, the, the weirdest outcome is it angered men more than women as responses go. I get a lot of women saying, thank you for showing the way it actually was versus men that feel appalled, the, you know, the amount of nudity shown. And I think that's really interesting. That says a lot still to this day. Um, you know, so it, that's kind of the the ultimate decision. Um, it, but it was not taken lightly at all. You know, um, yeah. In the end, and you know, again, it, it, like I said, as a documentarian, it was you know, it, and as and with the team behind it, um, it was ultimately decided we needed to show this the way it was. You know, this was not supposed to be a light watch at all. In the end, and and it, you know, I opened the film. Uh, basically saying going into this, it would have been really easy to kind of structure this like a, like a comedy and make fun of all this stuff. But like, honestly, as that weekend unfolds, it's much more like a horror film. And that's, that was, that was the intention. We had. Yeah. So we talked to Christine Vachon, the um, producer on the Velvet Underground doc. Yes. And um, she was saying that, that that project got started um, because the, the studio was sort of going through all of their intellectual property and trying to find teams to, uh, like synergize basically what, what they, what they could still, you know, find art, uh, new artistic uh-huh. uh, in, endeavors around. And it, it, between that and, you know, music box is launching right now with get back is basically the most prominent pop culture uh, in America at the time. I'm, I'm sort a, of, I'm sorry, I just didn't, I'm so yeah. upset. Get back are you guys enjoying it or oh it's it's the, it's the best I, I i don't really want to watch any want other content back. right now it's unfair so i'm i'm curious with you know all these streaming services are are sort of in an arms race on um archival footage to make new new great rock docs and uh look we we love we love having them all we're we're fans of the form but i'm, I'm interested in what you um make as a documentarian of the sort of uh, rock doc industrial complex that's that's developing right now and uh and whether you have any thoughts of doing another project yeah it's it's crazy right like i mean what's well, not crazy i mean let's let, rock docs are catnip right i mean first of all i'll watch any music documentary good or bad yeah. <laughs> they're great you're you're one of our people okay yeah <laughs> I mean, it's like and it's like listen who doesn't want to hear you know a fall from grace story which most of them end up being um but uh, it it's it is hard, you know. It, there's a pressure now after you, I, I made one, and I also like I so I was an editor before I started directing films. I edited a Janis Joplin documentary. I worked in a lot of music docs, and like it's always been kind of my favorite thing to cut, you know, cutting between music and storytelling, you know, and and, and commentary. Um, and like I said, they, they're also they're ripe for talking about the culture of the time and kind of going down that that deep dive. But as I move forward, you know, I get approached now, like, what, what music doc do you want to do next? And I'm like, I have no idea. Because first of all, I feel like archives are drying up a little bit, you know, as become so popular. Um, at least right now, it feels like that. From the artists I want to talk about. Um, as far as the future, I think, I think it's, you know, it's interesting. All these labels are starting to kind of create their own media sections, yeah. you know. We had UMG as a partner in this. Um, you know, Sony has, you know, they're kind of starting to dig on their own archives and they, they see the popularity of these documentaries. 
Um, so I think the next step is the labels actually saying, hey, we have this. <laughs> Who's the right person to tell the story? Kind of like what you're talking about with the Velvet Underground. Um, yeah. Versus me saying, I want to tell the story. And I got to go hunt it down, you know, which was kind of what happened in the past. Who has this footage? Um, now the labels themselves and the music conglog- conglog- conglomerates, congl- I can't say the word right now, <laughs> yeah. are starting to search for the right filmmaker to tell their stories. You know, they, they, they see they're sitting on this valuable stuff. Um, the hardest part is artist participation you know you don't want to you don't you you don't you want to show both sides of the coin in these stories um and it's 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 hard not to put some of these people on pedestals all the time you know and get them to kind of be a part of these storytelling because you know i think as human beings we want to see the warts in all stories we want to humanize people <laughs> um and so i think finding that kind of you know that team of where you have an artist that's willing to participate and be honest and unguarded and tell their story or some of these moments in, in, you know, in their careers, along with having the right archive is the most important thing in telling stories. And, you know, it's, I think it's harder to find that, you know, as, as, as we move forward. Um, and also there's a, there's a business now, now, you know, you have people like, you know, that are getting paid lots of money to make their documentaries like your Justin Bieber's, your Billie Eilish's, you know. So it's even yeah. harder, I think, you know, especially if you're an independent documentarian filmmaker to want to do a rock doc on some of these bands because it's becoming such a business. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know. Um, yeah. Well said. The hell, these stories, you know, like, as, as far as the storyteller, you know, using music and commentary. Well, Garrett, thank you so much. I know we're up against your time. Um, thank you for both taking the time uh, to talk with us, but also the, you know, all the thought you've obviously put into this project. It definitely shows, um, you know, best of luck with, uh, you know, the next, uh, the next project. Um, do you want to tell people where to find you or anything you want to plug or share? You make these films, you kind of give it to the world and kind of move on a little bit. And, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's, I feel very lucky that, you know, there's, like you said, there's so many films and, you know, and, and content out there that this one was able to kind of, you know, make its mark at a time and kind of jump into the conversation, you know, when I think it was really important to, you know, and create, you know, so, you know, I, I never wanted this film to be didactic, I guess, in nature. I just wanted a lot of people that experienced this festival to give their point of view, you know, and let everyone have a chance to talk about it, whether they participate in this film or not. Um, and it's created like, you know, it's created think pieces and conversations and podcasts. And that was always the attention intention of this film was to create this conversation at a time that I think has a bit of like kind of rose tinted nostalgia toward time towards, but also at the same time, you know, you can start to see some of the, you know, some of the, the I guess the umbilical cord, like I said, in the film to where we are now. And I think that's really important to go back and look at history that way. So um, as far as looking at me up, you have Garrett. Price on Twitter, Instagram, um, and uh, yeah. Well, we will be uh, looking for what you do next. Thanks a lot, Garrett. Uh, we appreciate it, and um, yeah, best of luck. Take care, David. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, thanks. All right.